In the Supreme Court's oral argument in Heller versus the District of Columbia, Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kendi made an observation that says, isn't it the fact that our founding fathers needed firearms to deal with hostile Indian tribes and other things? Yes, he did. And that leads us to Monday's observation of two holidays, Columbus Day, and thanks to Joe Biden, Indigenous Peoples Day. I thought this was an opportunity to talk about how the Founding Fathers viewed many of the Native Americans at the time of our Second Amendment's founding. Stay tuned. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of The Four Box of Diner, proud American governor, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and author of Disarmed, What the Ukraine War Teaches Americans About the Right to Bear Arms. Perhaps I should now rename it What the Ukraine War Teaches Israelis about the right to bear arms. All right, folks, so we just finished celebrating Columbus Day and certain parts of the United States, and apparently according to the Biden administration, all across America simultaneously with Columbus Day. Also Indigenous Peoples Day. Well, I thought that was like a perfect opportunity to do a little bit of history here about how our founding fathers that formulated the Second Amendment's right to keep their arms viewed and considered the Indians or Native Americans, whichever one you will. And to begin with, let us remember that this is all pertinent to Second Amendment jurisprudence because there's a famous quote by Justice Anthony Kennedy during the Heller Oral Argument in 2008 that said this. He basically asked the District of Columbia, the government's lawyer, isn't it a fact that the founding fathers, that the frontiersmen, that the people that formed the Second Amendment, didn't they need the right to keep, it, the right to keep and bear arms to deal with, quote, Hostile Indian tribes and outlaws, wolves and bears and grizzlies and things like that. Justice Kennedy's question in Heller ties back into our original founding document, the July 4th, 1776 Declaration of Independence, which, of course, laser focuses on we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are the, the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And of course, it goes on from there. But in critical part, they lay out, the Founding Fathers lay out in detail why they feel that they have to break the bonds and separate from Great Britain. One of the critical issues is their dealings with the quote-unquote merciless Indian savages. Here's what the Declaration says about one of the things that King George, English King George III, did to them. Quote, King George III has excited domestic insurrections among us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Period. Close quote. That is how the Founding Fathers viewed the Native Americans, the Indians, at the time of our founding which is where Justice Kennedy, of course, got his questions. And by the way, the concerns about the dangerous Indians, the merciless Indian savages, uh, were well-founded. Now, don't forget that the Indians and the Native American tribes, in many respects, had legitimate beefs, that they were losing their property, they were losing ground, and so be it. Okay, well, you know, so did King George. He had a legitimate beef that we were, you know, rebelling against him. Doesn't mean that he's right, doesn't mean he wins. But nevertheless, there's something to keep in mind that the merciless Indian savages or the Native Americans were indeed quite dangerous to the Founding Fathers. And I just want to tell one quick story from the year of our Lord, 1791, which is a year you know quite well, because in 1791, that is the same year that the Bill of Rights, including the Second Amendment's right to keep arms, was ratified. And I just want to tell you about some defeat, specifically the largest, most decisive defeat in the history of the American military, that was called the Battle of St. Clair. Sometimes this is referred to as the Battle of a Thousand Slain. Sometimes it's referred to as St. Clair's Defeat, or sometimes the Battle of the Wabash River. Bottom line is this, that during this fight, Native American tribes ganged up and had a huge fight with the American military, the American army. And it turned out that of the some odd thousand American men in the army that went out to fight the Native Americans, there were only, I believe, about 24 that survived. That's right. Of the 1,000 officers and men that St. Clair led into battle, only 24 escaped unharmed. In fact, it was so bad that President George Washington forced General St. Clair to resign his post 
And this is also has another historical meaning that Congress initiated its first investigation of the executive branch after the debacle associated with this terrible, tragic, huge, decisive battle that was that was the defeat of the U.S. Army at the hands of the Native Americans, a series of Indian tribes that fought them. So again, when we're talking about indigenous people, we must keep in mind that these are not the Disneyland animated characters that we might see in, let's say, the animated movie uh, Pocahontas. Uh, these were very tough individuals. These were tough groups. They were warlike uh, you know, individuals and groups and tribes, and they were tough. And that is why, and they were, you know, they were mean, right? Uh, in fact, there's an entire genre of literature called essentially Captivity Digest, where uh, various frontiersmen, men, women, children, were captured by Indians. Sometimes they were enslaved. They were brought to Canada sometimes. They were brought into the fold of the Indian tribes. And again, there's an entire body of literature called the Captivity Digest or the Captivity Diaries uh, that you can check out for yourself and read some of these personal first-hand accounts of these captivity narratives where people are captured by the Indians and different things happen in the tribe to them and to people they know. Uh, and a lot of it, let's just say, ain't very pretty. So with that said, uh, I do want to, of course, acknowledge that we are celebrating Columbus Day, 1492. He sailed the ocean blue and, of course, Indigenous Peoples Day. And, of course, we have to keep in mind that the Indigenous peoples that the Founding Fathers were talking about were, in many instances, much more akin to the merciless Indian savages and to the hostile Indian forces that Justice Kennedy was referring to during the Heller or argument involving, of course, the Second Amendment. So I hope you had a pleasant Columbus Day and Indigenous Peoples Day. And again, we can always tie anything into the Second Amendment because our history all goes back to that Bill of Rights to the founding period of 1791. And of course, from the Founding Fathers' point of view, one of the reasons why we have a Second Amendment is because of some of the conduct of the indigenous peoples and, of course, others, including outlaws, hostile forces, insurrectionists, and so on. So it's not just the indigenous people. But when we think about the indigenous people, we should always remember Justice Kennedy's famous quote, Dern Heller, and we should also remember that, indeed, one of the reasons why we have the right to keep and bear arms is because of concerns about the indigenous peoples that the Founding Fathers in the Declaration at least refer to as the merciless Indian savages. So next Indian Indigenous Peoples Day, Columbus Day, Always remember that indeed it ties right into our Second Amendment. Okay, folks, hope you learned a little bit something here today at the Four Box of Diner. If you have not subscribed, please do so. Don't forget to follow me on X at Four Box of Diner, and we'll see you again soon here at the Four Box of Diner. Orders up, table 2A.